he influenced, oh, thank you, sorry, I had forgotten to turn it on. Um, he influenced an entire generation. Over the course of his life, he wrote nearly 40 books. And one of the stories he told, I want to use to introduce this morning's message, he told about a composer, a Jewish composer who was in the concentration camp with him. And this Jewish composer one night had a dream. And this was his dream. God said to him, you can ask me any question you want. And so he said, do you know what I ask? And Viktor Frankl didn't answer fast enough. And so he said, I ask him when this war is going to be over for us. When we in this camp will be liberated. And Dr. Frankel said, did he give you an answer? And he said, yes. He said, March 30th, we will be liberated. And he, Dr. Frankel said, he was so excited and so encouraged. And then as March 30th began to get close and the news from the war didn't look promising, he began to get discouraged. On the 29th of March... He got sick, became delusional. On the 30th of March, he had to be confined to bed. On the 31st of March, he died. And Frankel talked about the fact that hope is an essential part of life. He said everybody else thought the man died from typhus, but the reality was he gave up. He lost all hope. There are a lot of people in the world who fall into that category. They lose hope. This series on 1 Peter is all about helping us understand that no matter what happens to us, no matter how difficult life becomes, we don't have to give up. Because of God, there is always something to hope for. We, we can keep believing we can keep hanging on. If you would open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter 1, verse 13. If you're using one of ours, it's on page 934. Verse 1 of 1 Peter 1 talks about the fact that in one sense, those of us who are believers, who our ultimate home is in heaven, there is a sense that we are foreigners here. We don't completely fit. And we're seeing that more and more as time goes along and culture becomes less and less influenced by biblical values, we fit less and less well. And I think that's probably going to become more pronounced as time goes along. I'm reading some things that are going on in the country and there are now some churches that basically are enduring the early stages of persecution. If they say something which is not considered correct, by some government leaders, then they're being really hassled. And I think we're only seeing the start of what will become an avalanche in another 10 years. My point is not to discourage you, but to in fact encourage you. Because I think no matter what happens, and I hope I'm wrong, and that that will not gain steam, but regardless, what I want to share with you this morning is that we can have hope and we can have perspective because... What we have is bigger than just here. Wouldn't it be great if when we came to Christ, we just never had any more problems? How many of you that has been your experience? When you began following God, just all your problems disappeared, life became perfect, you never felt sick anymore, you always jumped up out of bed first thing in the morning, ready to face the day. Hands up nice and high. Okay, what about this one? Once you've started following God, you and your spouse never ever argued and fussed anymore. Oh, come on. Somebody, no. We would know you were being dishonest. Because the Christian life is not about perfection in this life. It's about the hope we have that is bigger than this life. It's about the fact that we have an eternal hope. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. God gives us hope not for perfection, but for deeper meaning. That there is something that is worth believing in which will give us 
a new perspective on life. That's what I want us to talk about this morning. I want us to talk about that perspective about what we have going on. If you have found 1 Peter chapter 1, let's begin reading with verse 13. And please follow along with me as we read, and I'll read out loud, and you please read quietly. So here is what Peter writes. So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then. But now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. But you must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But he has now revealed him to you in these last days. Through Christ you have come to trust in God, and you have placed your faith and hope in God because He raised Christ from the dead and gave Him great glory. You were cleansed from your sin when you obeyed the truth. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart, for you have been born again, not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. As the Scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. So get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like unborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's goodness. Let's pray together. God, open your word to us this morning and encourage us to live with a new kind of perspective. God, help us to have the perspective to live hopeful, godly lives today. In your name we pray these things. Amen. God's children are to live during hard times, and they're to live in some specific ways with some specific perspective. Here's where I want us to start the morning. We're to live with holy perspective. In the opening words of verse 13, he says, so think clearly. Actually, that, that statement in the original Greek is very different. It doesn't say literally, so think clearly. It literally says, so gird up your loins. What in the world would that mean? His, here is what it meant. In the ancient days when Peter was writing, men typically wore robes, as did women. And if a man was wearing a robe that went down almost to his ankles and he was going to do some hard work, he would gird up his loins. What he would do is he would reach down and grab the robe, fold it up, and tuck it into his belt so he could work. It's what you did before you did something that required real effort. So what he is saying here is, listen, so think clearly. I want you to get ready for what's coming because there's some work to be done. So he says, so think clearly. And you'll notice the next statement he makes in verse 13. He said, and to exercise self-control. Really, the word self-control there is an interesting word. It's literally the word sober. It's sober in contrast to being drunk. So here is what he says. I want you to think this through. I want you to get ready for something important. And I want you to be really sober about this. What I'm getting ready to tell you is really significant. This holy perspective that he's talking about here. What Peter commands us is to prepare our minds and to be serious about what's going on. Rather than being controlled from the outside, we are to be controlled by the Holy Spirit as He lives within us. You may remember that uh, Paul talked about this. He talked about the fact that we are to be... Well, let me tell you how Peter talked about it here. Let me read J.B. Phillips' paraphrase. He said, live as those who know what they are doing. 
In other words, I want you to really think about this carefully because it's important. And then, I mentioned it before, Paul. Paul was going to give additional details. Paul would write in Romans 12 too. He said, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. J.B. Phillips would, would paraphrase that. Don't let the world press you into its mold. Have you ever felt pressure to conform? If you haven't, you're very unusual. Most of us feel that. But Peter here, as he's talking, wants us to understand that this is more than simply outlasting life's hard times. It's not moving into merely discouraged resentment. It's living with a higher calling, living with a higher purpose. Look at this first statement in, under that first point. When it comes to living the Christian life, we're to be very serious. And that's really what he's saying. We're to, we're to get ready for action. We're to, we're to pull our robe up so we can get around better. We are to be sober. We're to be serious about this. We're to live intentionally. We're not to copy what's going on around us. He reminded them that they were not to go back to their old lifestyle, but he made the point of what had been different back then. Verse 14, you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better back then. Can you ever remember doing something wrong and you didn't even know it? I did that this morning. If you notice, partway in the service, as just after I made the announcements, Vanessa came up and she was talking to me. I don't know if you noticed that. But she said, your, your, your wireless transmitter is not working. Is, is it turned on? And I looked and it was turned on. Then I discovered the problem. It was turned on, but it wasn't plugged in. <laughs> and yeah, it was good that we found it, but it was some foolish pastor, we're not going to mention any names here, of course, had just not plugged it in. I took it and hooked it all up. And Jeff. Jeff did it, yes. It was Jeff. <laughs> no, it was not Jeff. It was me. But we've all done that before. We've not, we overlooked something, haven't we? Am I the only one? No, I know I'm not. We have all been there. But, but Peter says, look back at your old life and you did some really dumb things, but you didn't even know better. You didn't know what you were doing. But he says, now you know better. You have grown in your faith and so your understanding of, of right and wrong and what to do, you now understand the truth. In contrast to their old way of life, Peter reminds them that they're to now be holy in everything they do. That's at the very heart of all the Hebrew religion. That statement is found actually in Leviticus 11.44, which is quoted in verse 16. He says, you must be holy because I am holy. The word holy there is the word hegios. And the word hegios literally means to be separate. It means here is evil and you separate yourself from it. Here is what's wrong and you don't do that. Now, they, the word holy is used in many, many ways. The temple was considered holy. It was a separate building than all other buildings. Jesus was holy. He was separate from evil. Now, I want, to, I want to make sure you understand, though. Jesus loved people who messed up. He didn't separate himself from people who messed up. He just separated himself from sinning himself. We are not to, not to have nothing to do with people who mess up. Because if we started separating from people who mess up, we would all be hermits. Because everybody messes up. That's not his point, but we are to live godly lives. We are to separate ourselves from wrong. Not separate ourselves from wrong people, but from doing wrong ourselves. That's his point. So, look in your notes for one more statement. Being holy means we are to live righteous lives, but it does not mean we are to have a holier-than-thou attitude. And if you want to know what that looks like, look at Jesus. Remember Jesus and the story found in the Gospel of John where the woman who had been taken in the very act of adultery was brought to him? And do you remember what all the religious leaders were doing? They were saying, listen, you should stone her. And remember what Jesus said? First, nothing. And then he said those famous words. The one of you who is without sin, 
he has my permission to cast the first stone. And they suddenly realized, although maybe they had not done the very thing the woman had, they had sinned in other ways. And they all began to leave. So we are not to be holier than thou, but we are to be holy. We are to be godly. That's what Peter was talking about. Notice verse 17, he says, We are to live in reverent fear of him. Now there's been a trend in the last few years to any time that word fear, phobos, is used in the New Testament, the translators change it to reverence. And that's not totally wrong, but it's also not totally right. God is our Father, and we all enjoy that reality, do we not? But Scripture also says not only is He our Father, but He is also our Judge. Now, I grew up in a, in a loving home. I had wonderful parents. But sometimes, as a little boy, I did wrong. Yeah, it happened more than I want to admit. At six years old, I tore up a library book and said my brother did it. He got in trouble. And I felt more guilty. And then, I confessed. It was not fun. The reality was, I messed up. And in that moment, I was scared of my parents. Not scared that they would mistreat me, because they never did that, but scared of the consequences. And there were consequences, as there should have been. God says, listen, we are to fear him. Not in the sense of like a, a slave who fears a vengeful, horrible master. But I feared my parents because they were going to correct me, and I knew it. They were doing it for my own benefit. I didn't fully understand that as a six-year-old child. But I look now at some of the children I see who are never disciplined for anything. And I realize they did me an incredible favor. Well, God is the perfect parent. You get out of line and he will deal with you. Not because he doesn't love you, but because he does. And so there is a reverence and a fear as well. Not that God's going to mistreat us, but that God will not overlook what we do that is wrong. That he, he makes that point. And that brings us to the second point in this morning's message. When it comes to challenging time, not only are we to have a holy perspective, but we are to live with spiritual perspective. Peter recommends to his, or reminds his readers that God paid the price to redeem them, and that price was his son. In those days, ransoms were paid to purchase the freedom for prisoners of war. If you had a family member who was captured by an enemy army and you were willing to ransom them or pay the price, you probably could get that prisoner of war returned to you. They also had slavery. And if you had a friend who got too much in debt and had been sold to pay the debt, and you as a family member or friend had the money, you could ransom that slave, you could pay the debt, and they could go free. And Peter says, listen, that's what God has done with us. Our sin racked up a debt that we couldn't pay, and then he paid the bill. Jesus points out that's precisely what God did for us by sending His Son. He pointed out the incredible cost to God. It cost Him more than mere precious gold or silver. It actually cost God His Son. In fact, the comparison makes gold and silver look insignificant. It didn't just cost God some precious metal. It cost Him the most precious thing that He had, His own Son. And it's interesting... In verse 20, we learn a fact that not many people know. God chose Jesus to pay the price for our sin long before he made the world. See it there? Verse 20, God chose him as our ransom long before the world began. So I want you to think about this. Before God said the first, I do, and things started to appear, he already knew what it was costing him to say, let there be. He knew where it was going to lead. Before he started creating anything, he already knew it was going to cost him his son. And he did it anyway. He knew the cost. 
Before he was creator, he already had the plan to be redeemer. But he created us anyway. He created the world, knowing what it was going to cost him. So here's the reality. This is the first statement under that second point. God not only made us, he also paid the price for our salvation. By his death, Jesus delivered us from the bondage to sin, and through his resurrection, he gave us a life which is glorious and indestructible. We have faith and hope because of that. That's an amazing point, but I want you to notice where Peter takes this in his next thought. Look at verse 22. He says, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love for each other. Now, he wants us to understand that this faith, this ransom, this salvation is to produce a change in us. And what is that change supposed to entail? You see it there in verse 22? What is the word he uses? What is supposed to happen because we have this faith? We are to be people of what? Love. See it there? You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other. Fervently, some translations say. The, the point is, love is a big deal. See, this is a really big deal. And he, he describes it sincere, which means unhypocritical. And then he says it is to be a deep love. Love each other deeply with all your heart. So this is supposed to be a really big deal. And this is the effort that should go into love. How many of you are planning on watching the Olympics? They're about to start in about two, two is it two weeks, I believe? Yeah. You're going to start in two weeks? And you will watch runners line up at the starting blocks to run the 100 meter dash. Now, which one of those runners will you see who will st stretch out beforehand? They'll all do that. And then they will get down in the blocks, and they'll be waiting for the shot to begin the race, right? And at the shot, they will all stand up and begin strolling leisurely down the lines toward the finish line. No, that is what nobody in the Olympics ever does. Every muscle in their body is tensed to give every single ounce of energy they have in the next 100 meters so that their hope is they will win a prize, a gold medal, a silver medal, a bronze medal, or at least that they won't embarrass themselves. They put everything into it. Peter here says we have been called by God and we are to put everything within us into loving. To love one another. Loving one another is serious business. Because let's be honest, sometimes we do not feel very loving. Do you always feel loving? Do you always feel like being sweet to your spouse? Don't answer that. Because I know the answer. Do you always feel like being loving to every person you know? You don't have to answer that either because I know the answer. I'm generally pretty decent. I'm, I'm pretty decent at being kind to people, but every once in a while I get a phone call, especially from a salesperson who just won't take no. And I usually just hang up now. But I've been tempted on occasion to be really smart-mouthed with them. Anybody understand? And I realized, you know what? Even those people, you know, I'm called to be loving even to them. Now, that doesn't mean I have to stay on the phone for 30 minutes. And, and honestly, I, I'm, but I'm not going to badmouth them and be hateful to them. They don't need that. They get that 100 times a day. I'm, I'm just using an extreme example. But you know what I usually will do is I will, and this is the way I've decided I can be loving and yet firm at the same time. I will say, no thank you, I appreciate, you know, thank you for your time, but I'm not interested. And then if they go on talking as if I never said a word, I just hang up. Which I think is appropriate. But I'm not going to say, you stupid jerk. Didn't you hear what I just said? Da 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 da. There's no sense of going there. They're doing a job. Not a very pleasant job, I might add. But you understand? And, and in dealing with one another, and I, I brag on you guys all the time about this, but this is a very loving church family. 
You have to be. You put up with me. You, you know, we, we love each other. That's what we are called to do. Do you see that? Verse 22. We are called to do that. Our faith means that we are supposed to be people of love. In fact, look at the next statement in your notes. One of the central themes of Scripture and the early church is that we are to love one another. It's one of the strongest statements about Christian love in the entire New Testament. It practically makes brotherly love, which actually the word for love there is the word Philadelphia. You know what the word Philadelphia means? Brotherly love. It means the love within a family that we have for one another. We are to love one another. We are to be people known for love. Isn't that what Jesus said? By this all people will know that you are disciples if you love one another. I've said this before. If people look at us and we don't love one another, we have proved that we're not really serious disciples of Jesus. That's just the truth. Our theology can be all correct. We can be right on so many levels, but if there is no love, according to Jesus' definition, we're not really His disciples. It really is kind of scary. So my, because I know some Christians who are theologically exactly on the mark. But there's no love. They're rigid. And frankly, hateful. I knew some Christians growing up that couldn't wait to tell you where you were wrong. Just loved being around those people. That was a joke. That's not what Jesus calls us to do. And that's not what Peter is calling us to do. Not at all. We are to love one another. Well, that brings us to the final point in the message this morning. Let's finally look at the fact that we are to live with godly perspective. In this final section, Peter reminds believers that everything in this life, possessions, accomplishments, people will eventually fade and disappear. He's emphasizing the importance of eternal life. He made the point that we have to be born again, but then when we're born again, life doesn't end. Many people think that the Christian life is salvation, and then it's done. That's not true. Salvation is merely the first step in eternal life. Then there is growth to be done. There is maturity that we are to be growing in. We don't stop there, we start there. It's like when kids graduate from high school and they say, finally I'm done. That is their perspective because they've been working toward graduation. But those of us who are older, we know, now life really starts. You know, they don't understand that. But in a very real sense, that is when life begins. In a very real sense, salvation is the beginning of your spiritual life. It's not the end. It's where it begins. Peter's next point connects the statement he just made with quotes from Isaiah 40, verses 6 to 8. Notice he says, People are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. And his point is that this life is very, very temporary. Any of you have been to class reunions from, school, from your schools that you graduated from? How many of you were shocked at how much some of those other people had aged? I, I actually ran across a joke that I thought was really funny. Uh, someone was saying, you know, they were looking at their, their uh, passport pictures. Passport pictures have to be taken every 10 years. And this one lady was looking at her passport picture and talking to the government official, and she said, I just hate this picture. It doesn't look good. And the passport official said, trust me, you will like it much better than you will the next picture 10 years from now. <laughs> Very true. Have you looked back at your pictures from 10 or 12 years ago? We change. We age. Life is short. We're like a beautiful flower, you know. Frankly, I've known some people that were beautiful and when I knew them as young people and I meet them later and they didn't age so well. Oh, come on. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm not putting them down. I'm saying you can be beautiful when you're young and it doesn't mean you'll be beautiful when you're old. And I've known some people who were sweet when they were young and they turned into bitter people. <laughs> when they got old. Haven't you known the same thing to happen? 
You know, life is short. This is about something bigger than merely this life. And we, we move so quickly. And the reality is, when it comes to looking at life, if your hope is totally in this life, you don't have much to hope for. Let me illustrate. Everybody here, I assume, probably knows your parents. How many of you personally met and could give me details about your grandparents? Hands up, nice and high please. Okay, hands down. How many of you know all about your great grandparents and could tell me all kinds of details about them? Hands nice and high. I want you to notice there's three hands up. How many of you know and could tell me all about your great, great grandparents? Look at all the hands that are not raised. My point is, right now you are living, you will live here for a while, but if your entire focus in life is focused on this life, you'll only be known, even through your family, for about the next 80 years. I don't know my great-great-grandfather's names on either side. I never met them. I don't know anything about them. I know they were country folk. Total of what I know. But our hope is not merely in this life. This life, in all likelihood, you will live to be 70 to 80, perhaps 90, and you will die and you will be forgotten. But according to God, you'll still be living on for eternity. And so he says we are to live. This holy living means we understand that living is, is bigger than us. Look at the next statement in your notes. Living godly means that we're to live with an eternal perspective. We're to understand that the spiritual life is not limited to 70, 80, or 90 years. It, it's bigger than that. As we move into chapter 2, the focus changes a little bit. The emphasis on love continues. This is Peter's challenge to love one another. He says we're to get rid of the attitudes that destroy loving relationships. Do you see it there in verse 1? He says, so get rid of all evil behavior. Be done with deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Those are all things which get in the way of love. Anybody here enjoy being around people who are hypocrites? Who are always deceiving, never telling the truth? who are saying unkind things all the time. Those are all related to this loving he's been talking about. He says, listen, you're to work together. You are to love one another. You're not to let your, your character and your behavior be characterized by these unkind things. Some people just tell the truth, but they do it in such harsh ways. He tells us we are to be people of love. Our lives are to be characterized by that. I want you to fill out the next statement in your notes. And I know you just filled out one, but we're finishing up. God wants each of us to deal with our own ungodly behavior. We're to deal with our undesirable traits. And here's how we do it. As we become more godly, God will deal with us to help us confront those things that we need to change. He'll point them out because He's... Our Father. And he uses an analogy in verse 2. He says, like newborn babies, you must crave the pure spiritual milk. And, and really what he's saying is, we need to take more and more of what God provides for us. And as we do, it will change us from the inside out. He wants us to understand that's what's involved. Peter wasn't implying that all of them were young believers because some of them probably had been believers for as many as 30 years. But he was saying this, this idea was that we are to crave more and more of God, and as we get closer to God, God will change more and more of us. I, my daughter Johanna has been home this weekend. She is actually speaking at a church in Illinois, so she's not here this morning. But I remember when she was an infant, and I can remember when she would be hungry and we didn't get the bottle fixed fast enough, she would become desperate. She would go from screaming and wailing one moment to trying to suck the nipple off that bottle. I mean, instantly, she would go from screaming to eating. 
And really what he's saying is this. Look at this final statement in your notes. We should be as desperate for God as a newborn is for milk. We should want to be close to God because as God lives inside of us and changes us, He gives us hope. We need to understand how good God has been to us. We can have hope no matter what's going on. Because our hope is not connected to this world, it's connected to eternal things. We are to be holy according to God's standards, not according to our own. We are to be people of love, God's kind of love. We're to love one another, no matter what happens. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Bob and Debbie, would you come and prepare our, our time of reflection? You know, all of us have to come to God for for forgiveness. That's where it all starts. And if you don't know Him, then you have not taken advantage of the sacrifice that God made for you, planned before He even started making the world. And if you are a follower of God, then sometimes, as Bob talked about earlier, we start looking in all the wrong places, and there's nothing wrong with Google, but that's not the ultimate answer. God is the ultimate answer. So as we come to the conclusion of this service, I'm going to ask that you, you look in your own heart and say, am I living that hope that Peter talked about? That hope that's bigger than just this life. A hope that's connected to eternal life. God, you know our hearts. You know who we are. You know where we struggle and how we struggle. God, I pray that you would help each of us to follow you passionately. God, you know where each of us is in our spiritual journey, and I pray that you would help each of us to take another step in that journey this morning, wherever we may be. In your name I ask these things. Amen.